Hi, this is Aaron Marcus, and welcome back to the Acting and Modeling Success Summit. Uh, we have a really neat person that uh, you're going to learn a lot from. Her name is Brenna McDonough, and let me share with you some information about her. Uh, she owns On Camera Training Studio, and it's located in Silver Spring, Maryland. She's been training talent for TV and film and webcasts since 1995. She's also a faculty member at Theater Lab in Washington, D.C., and Brenda's a full-time actor, and she's been cast in numerous TV uh, shows and films. And fortunately, we've had a chance to work together sometimes. She also co-authored with her husband, John Leslie Wolf, uh, the book, You Can Work on Camera. Brenda, thank you so much for being here at the summit. Thank you, Aaron. So one of the things that you do, and you teach a lot of things in your on-camera classes, but one of the things is teaching people how to use a teleprompter. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask if you would just share some information uh, about what is a teleprompter and really how, how would you possibly use it in the acting world? Right. Well, um, a teleprompter is a device that's attached to the camera. So when you look in the camera and you're about to make a presentation, what you see are your words, the script that you're required to present. So you don't really see the lens of the camera because this device fits over the lens of the camera. It just looks like a screen, like a, almost like a TV screen, slightly smaller. Um, and then there's a teleprompter operator that's attached to that in another part of the room who's listening to everything you say and checking the script as you go along. Um, so basically, you're just looking into the lens, but I always recommend, imagine you're talking to someone when you're presenting and your script is right there in front of you and it uh, uh, eliminates the uh, necess necessity of having to memorize. And when you're talking about the operator, is the operator that's the person who is changing the, you know, the, uh, the, the lines uh, as you're reading? Um, they're not necessarily changing the lines. They they get the changes from the director or the writer. But they're I'm sorry, I, what I really meant was they're, they're scrolling. They're exactly right. They're that's scrolling. Scrolling. So, so uh, the misconception I hear from a lot of people is, well, the teleprompter went too fast on my last job. And that only means one thing, because I, I say that the teleprompter is actor activated or voice activated. In other words, when you start to speak, they start to scroll. So the person who's presenting is setting the pace. If it's going too fast or too slow, it means one thing, that you, the presenter, are going too fast or too slow. I always say a teleprompter operator is listening so closely they can hear it when you blink your eyes. And and so basically, if because I, I know one of the areas where you will use a teleprompter uh, are for uh, they're called industrial films or educational uh -huh. films or corporate films and basically, basically these are training films mm -hmm. uh, in, in different situations and sometimes well actually you know what you know would be helpful if, if you would also explain what is an on-camera narrator because sometimes we do get hired to be the on-camera narrator for an industrial film so we, would you just explain what that means? Well, there are a number of categories. There's the on-camera narrator, so that would be the person who is sort of the face of the topic. Uh, and they're introducing things. And then there are the day players, or and those are the other people who, in another part of the training film, might be sitting around a conference table laboring over whatever topic the narrator has presented. So the narrator is the front man. He's the person, he or she is the person who's talking directly to the camera. They don't have any other people in the scene. They're sort of seen as the authority of what the subject matter is. Um, well, I, could, I, could, I was just going to say, excuse me, on a little bit of a side note, uh, sometimes it, it, it's kind of crazy because the on-camera narrator, at least if you are in the union, you get paid a whole lot more oh, than if you are one of the day players, one of the actors who's working on the project for a day or even a couple of days. And the crazy thing is, it's the regular actors, the on-camera, I mean, the uh, just the day players. We spend so much time having to memorize the lines. Mm -hmm. And and the crazy thing is we're getting paid a lot less than the on-camera narrator who can walk in, look at the teleprompter, uh -huh. and do their work and go home. 
Yeah, well, I, I guess that's what experience and uh, union membership will, will will do for you. Well, that's um, why you want to be the on-camera narrator whenever no possible. No kidding. You know, if there's a possibility for that or a day player, hmm, I think I know what I'd vote for. But again, it, it, it really all depends upon, and sometimes, you know, you can have very long passages on a teleprompter. And uh, it really, I always recommend that people study their script, um, study it very well prior to doing a teleprompter job because you want to be up on your skill as soon as that prompter starts to roll. I also believe that a prompter saves a production so much money because every time you make a mistake and you're memorizing, it's a whole lot different than making a mistake and just scrolling back a few sentences on a teleprompter. Well, and also you're going to get a lot further along when you've got the teleprompter. Um, certainly, you know, that makes a lot more sense. It shortens the day considerably. So basically, if you are hired and you're you're going to be using a teleprompter, mm -hmm. how how would you prepare when you are studying the slide? Certainly, you don't have to have it memorized. But I would tend to think that you know you're going to tell people. Well, you still have to be extremely familiar with it because do you constantly stare straight into the teleprompter the entire time or do you sometimes you know maybe look away and come back how, how do you you know how do you explain that to your talent well, usually when I tell people to prepare for a teleprompter job what 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 you need to do is um, when you're practicing uh, try to take in more than one word at a time on the page try to sort of read ahead I, I, I say and um, also sort of train your eye just when you're doing pleasure reading to read a sentence and then let your eye leave the page and see if you can come back to exactly where you left off. So you're sort of training your eye to take in a, a number of words at a time, read ahead a little bit, and also train your eye to leave the page and come right back to where you left off. Because when you're working on a teleprompter, you don't want to stare directly into the lens the whole time because then you'd look like, <laughs> like a zombie. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that. Not a friendly look. So you want to train yourself to sort of read along, then look away and gather your thoughts and make it appear conversational. Yeah, I mean, because otherwise you just sound like a robot. And typically, I mean, certainly, you know, e each project can be slightly different, but quite often, especially if it's technical information, you know, you're trying, you, you don't want it to sound like a textbook and you want it to sound like a human who is, you know, really trying to help somebody and help explain things to somebody, just like you said, in a way where you're, you know, sitting down and just having a conversation with somebody. Because right. uh, that's how you can get through some very, I mean, some very difficult material. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this a lot where, I mean, some, sometimes it's stuff that we really don't even understand. Right. I mean, I, I know that certainly has happened to me. You know, if I'm talking about fiber optic cables and building diesel engines, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to to say it in a way that it just seems like it's just rolling off your tongue, you know, in a very matter-of-fact way. Right. It's, you have to create some sort of conversational reality around what you're saying. And I think that's why actors get hired, you know, if we look like the corporate person that, that, that would represent their company, and then we have to give those words some vitality even if they are sort of dry. And, and so basically if you are let's just say the on-camera narrator and mm -hmm. you're starting to do your read and you're finding that the prompter is going too quickly for you mm -hmm. um, so basically how do you handle that like how, you know what would you say to the operator to you know make sure that it's working properly for you right well uh, again you set the pace and 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 you probably know that the pace at which you start out is the pace at which you'll continue or faster because we generally tend to pick up speed as we go along so I think um, if you start out slowly and if you're in touch with your breathing if you're really in touch with your breathing that's going to set the pace if you're breathing in a shallow manner you're going to speed up if you're really relaxed when you begin, that really makes a, a difference in your delivery. So um, the prompter operator is listening to you. When you start, they start. When you stop, they stop. But if you're getting ahead, um, it's it means that you're picking up speed as you're going along. So but it I, would be. But you would feel uh, perfectly comfortable in saying something 
to an operator if you would just say, hey, you know, would you mind just slowing that down just a little bit? I feel like you're kind of running the lines a, a little too quickly for me. Yeah. Just because sometimes you might get somebody who's not that experienced uh, who's running things. And That's sometimes, true. you know, you might have to train them to listen to you. Right. But I'm sure there are certain ways that you can say it that will be much more effective than others, like, you know, not throwing water bottles at the person. And, well, no, and you can just say, you know, I feel like, um, I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to make a conscious effort to slow down here, you know, or, or I need to see three sentences, three lines on the prompter instead of one line, you know, because if you're always searching for the words ready to come up too fast or too slow, you look over anxious and not relaxed. Yeah. And, and like you were saying, if you're not comfortable with the dialogue, because you haven't looked at it, you know, closely enough, then all of a sudden you're going to look like, you know, a deer in the headlights when things right. are starting to pop up for you. And, and certainly, I mean, some of the questions that, you know, that I ask, especially if you're doing, let's say, some kind of government work and there are initials. Um, for yeah, for for certain companies or organizations, I mean th that would be something that would be really important to ask ahead of time, Absolutely. so that when you're going through it, you know, how do you want me to, you know, pronounce? Is it you know NASA or do you want me to say NASA? Right. Which is, I mean, that's kind of a basic one, but y right. there are a lot of things like that. Now, now as far as when you are working with other actors. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they will have teleprompters, even if you are a day player and not necessarily an on-camera narrator, because they feel like, you know what, we're going to get our day done much, much quicker. Mm -hmm. um, or you, you might, I mean, something that, that, that I've done where I wasn't an on-camera narrator, but I was the doctor, and I'm the doctor that's seeing, you know, 15 patients throughout the day. Uh -huh. And it was a medical film, so the other actors didn't necessarily have prompters because I'm the one who has all the medical terminology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you deal with that when you're sitting in front of an actor? You've got the prompter, you know, mm -hmm. kind of over their shoulder. Yes. How do you look at the other actor and still do this project? Good question. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't realize this, and it takes a little practice. I, I just did a job yesterday where... I had a conversation, and my the other actor was uh, in front of me, across from me, sort of, at a, at a conference table. So their teleprompter was over my shoulder, and my teleprompter was over their shoulder. So I want to tell people this because you you don't you never want to go back and forth, person prompter, person prompter, when you're shooting a, a two person scene. You always look at the prompter, and the people who are setting up the shot will arrange that your eye line is consistent with where that person would be sitting or is sitting, but you're actually looking to the left or right of that person. So it appears as if you're talking to their person and looking in their eyes, but you're actually looking at your prompter. It's, it's wonderful. But the cameraman wonderful. will be able to determine how that's working out. You know, and the funny thing is, it, it, you know, in some ways, it kind of goes against everything that we've been taught, know. you know, because you've got to look at the other actor, you've got to see their eyes, you know, you have to be able to react to them, and really basically hard. what you have to do is completely Ignore stop me. everything that you've been taught mm -hmm. and really be able to listen to the person and react to their voice, but you can't see them. I know, you can't look um, because you're, you're right, if you start going back and forth to the actor and the prompter and the actor, then all of a sudden you look very shifty and shady and it's, it's not a very good look. Yes, yes. So you just lock on that prompter. And another thing I, I tell yeah. people is, oh, go ahead. No, 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 please, go ahead. Uh, when you get to a, a job, um, you know, you'll let the people know that you're there, but I always go over to the prompter operator and say, can I just look at the script and see how it looks the way he has it formatted? Because it won't look like the page of script that you have in front of you in your hard copy. So you just look over their shoulder, or sometimes you can stand in front while they're setting lights or you know, doing whatever they need to do to set up the production. And you can kind of rehearse, a little bit at least, of what the prompter is going to look like when you're standing in your spot. I think it's... I believe I don't think you can over prepare for a job necessarily, and I think it's a really good idea to practice every chance you get. 
Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I mean, I always ask while they are setting up, hey, would you, can I just can I just run through this a couple of times? Because you're right, it, it looks so different on paper than on a prompter. Just because you might only have four words on the prompter, and the you know the page itself could have twelve or fifteen words. So uh, you want to be very very familiar with it, and and also you can also still make notes so that during breaks, if you know okay when a certain word comes up, uh, there's going to be a pause, and you can recognize it on the prompter. Which uh, it's it's hard to do right on the fly. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, yeah, you, you you certainly cannot prepare enough. Right. Now there is something else that you are also an expert um, in, and you also teach, and a lot of people probably don't know about this, but it's called an ear prompter. Oh, yeah. And would would you explain what sure. an ear prompter is and and how do you use that? Sure. Uh, an ear prompter is al also another way to not have to memorize a lengthy script. And it consists of uh, uh, a couple of pieces. You have an earpiece that's connected to a recording that you've made uh, of the script that you've been given. And um, technology has really come a long way. We used to be all wired up where we had a wire going down our back and we had to <laughs> connected to a cassette player and it was great but but things have changed now we have, have digital recorders and we can have a wireless or remote s system so that we have the receiver getting the message from our digital recorder after it goes to to a little transmitter anyway it sounds a little bit more complicated but there's really only three pieces of, of equipment that you need more importantly so, so you record your script on your digital recorder, you put that in your pocket, the director calls action, you hit your go button on your recorder, and you're hearing your script in your ear. Now everybody goes, oh, how could you do that? It takes practice, but it's not as hard as it sounds, and boy is it convenient. And it saves you from productions where they can't afford a teleprompter operator, and also you don't have to memorize 30 pages of kind of boring script. I mean, so, Oh, excuse me, I was just going to say, and especially, let's say if there was a scene where even if it's not a matter of financing, just maybe physically you couldn't have a teleprompter. If you're walking down a hallway, uh, you're walking outside someplace and you can't have a teleprompter follow you and you have you know crazy amount of pages of dialogue, the you know, having an ear prompter is incredible. It, it saves you tremendously. So you hit your go button after the director calls action and then you wait to hear two or three, you're speaking two or three words behind what you're hearing. And I think that's what tricks people up. But again, you're familiar with your script. You're not saying anybody else's words. You're hearing your own voice. It just takes some training. In other words, again, practice. One of the things that, that I've noticed when I've seen people try to use ear prompters who are not very good at it, and this also happens when you try to start saying the very first word oh. that you hear, what happens is, it's the funniest thing, it's almost like a, a shark's eyes when they start to kind of roll up in their head, and you can see the eyes actually going <laughs> up, Love you it. know, through the sockets because tr you're trying to hear the word, yes. and, you know, for people who, and once again, I, I mean, I remember we did an industrial film once, and there was this one spot where you just had a lot of stuff on your own, uh -huh. and you just pulled out your ear prompter, and you were incredible, and, you know, you're just talking like this, but you're hearing all the words in your head, and, and you're right, I mean, that's been my experience as well, you always wait, I always wait for the third word to yes. uh, play in my head, so yes. the tricky thing is you're always three words behind. Exactly. You never as, want to be speaking the word you're hearing. Never. It's a disaster. Now, do you ever run into problems with either sound, uh, whether a microphone is picking up the sound in your ear um, as you're using the ear prompter? That does happen. And sometimes they can, in other words, I keep my earpiece in my left ear. And let's say my microphone is right here. And the mic is picking up my recording. So that's not a good thing. Well, you can do a number of things. You can reposition the microphone sometimes and work well with your sound person. But when I suggest that people practice, I suggest that they turn the volume down so far while they're practicing to see how low it can go and still and they can still hear themselves. And also how high you can stand the volume because sometimes you'll be in a place where there's a lot of ambient sound. So I say practice with a very low and see 
see how well you can do with that. And also if your microphone can be repositioned. Well, I know the one place where it's really tough, and I've only done this a couple of times in my life, but you know, sometimes you're hired as a like a spokesperson at a um, a huge convention for a company, and you're the one standing outside the booth, and you're explaining, you know, all the things about the company, and you're going to be doing this, you know, tons and tons of times a day. It might be a five minute talk, but you're going to do it all day long, and to, just to try to go by memory is really it's very difficult really? but one of the hard things is there's so much noise quite often these huge convention centers mm -hmm. that that you've got to start blasting the earpiece because it's hard to you know really hear yourself so that, that that can be a little bit tricky but when you really practice it a lot you can become pretty comfortable with it as well and also in a situation like that Aaron I recommend that people put an earplug in their other ear so that so that they're slightly less distracted with all like at the convention center. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, oh, exactly. I, I learned that from my husband. <laughs> hey, Brenda, I know we're going to have to wind this up, but I I know that there were some questions that have come in, and I definitely want to get to some questions before we uh, we finish today. So, um, actually, this one from Lorraine in Detroit, we've already answered that one uh, for her. This is an interesting one. This is from Gary in Oklahoma, and he uh, he's asking if you need if you need to wear glasses but you can't use them for the shoot and you're using a teleprompter. What do you do? How do you make the words larger? Right. Um, well, the teleprompter operator can enlarge the font to as large as you can see it. Now, keep in mind that the larger the font, the fewer words are on the screen in front of you. So. Um, but you can get larger font, you can get smaller font, you can get more contrast, you can have white letters on a back, black background or black letters on a white background, but you can get them to enlarge the font. Well, and the other suggestion, um, getting contacts. That might be really helpful to you as well. Really yeah. um, and it's always good, you know, just to have them just in case you need them and, you know, mm -hmm. if you're running into any problems. Mm -hmm. um, and get used to wearing them before you do your job. <laughs> At the very, so you're not like blinking the entire time there. This is from Yoel Montana. Um, he's asking, people talk about seeing the camera as your friend. Would you explain what that means? Right. And we say that in our book, too. Um, I used to say, imagine that you're talking to your best friend. Well, sometimes that's not pertinent to every script we have. but. I like to think of the camera as a heartbeat. Now, that heartbeat could be your parakeet if you want it to be, or one of your children, or your dog, or something. Just make it a, a living, breathing entity that you feel good talking to, or you know that they're looking at you in an approving way. And, and so do you actually try to visualize that person in I the do. camera itself? I do. I, I, Instead of seeing the little round circular dark hole, I pick one of two people. I often talk to my sister Meg when I'm delivering at an audition. You know, I just imagine talking to somebody that I know, or I imagine them asking a question about what I'm about to respond to. So I and I could, yeah. excuse me, I was just going to say, and I'm assuming that is when you're trying to go for the warm, friendly, fuzzy kind of read. Exactly. You know, if you know, if you're supposed to be this really nasty human being who's you know ready to you know, do, do some harm. horrible things. You might not want to use that. <laughs> I pick somebody else. <laughs> somebody maybe you don't like quite as much. There you go. Um, oh, this is an interesting question from Dave in Alabama. Um, if I don't have access to an on-camera teacher, um, are there any things that you can recommend that I can do at home just to try to practice? Well, you could buy my book. But besides that, um, yeah, I think I think um, watching television is a great tool, and uh, I, I think sometimes turning down the volume on TV and and try to understand what their nonverbal message is. I think this is a really good way to develop an eye and for for what you're seeing and maybe what you're figuring out you want to do. Um, there's online classes. There's books, there's videos, there's, there's all kinds of things. I also think some of the best training you'll ever get is a theater class, even if it's a scene study class. But if you don't have access to an on-camera class, I think there are a lot of sources out there. Um, 
and uh, just watching watching the pros and, and kind of figuring out your place in, in what you want to do. Maybe you just want to do commercials. Maybe you want to do movies. Uh, maybe you just want to do theater. You know, one thing that, that people have suggested uh, to me, and, and it seems like a really interesting idea, if you're trying to learn, let's say, like, for instance, how to use an ear prompter, mm -hmm. uh, something that you can do if you're listening, like you were talking about watching TV, you can also listen to, you know, watch commercials on TV or listen to commercials on the radio. And when they start, wait for the first three words to come in and then start, you know, start it. Uh, saying the lines from the very beginning and see if you can get through a commercial exactly simply right. being three words behind which uh, and that can be a really interesting thing the other thing too is without you know because buying an ear prompter uh, I mean when I bought mine I, um, I'm trying to think I think I might spend like I don't know $700 on one of, it's a wireless ear prompter mm -hmm. and then you know, it looks like a little hearing aid that goes in um, but if you don't want to make that kind of investment, and when you're first getting started, unless you're really serious about trying to get this kind of work, I wouldn't make that kind of investment. But you can go to a small electronics store and buy a very, very inexpensive tape recorder, you know, a mm -hmm. little micro cassette um, or you know, digital one. And even if it's a, a hardwired earpiece that you just you know Press. plug in and put it in your ear. And you can practice. You can practice doing this. You can just read from a magazine. You know, read from a newspaper. Read from a book, right. and start practicing doing that. I agree. And sometimes uh, when I, I continue to practice, and I'll do a lot of talk radio and, and talk two or three words behind. And sometimes I like to see if I can get five or six words behind. But um, also, I um, I'll turn on a sports station, and so that's clearly not my first language and if I can get sports scores out and things like that then I feel like I've really practiced <laughs> a good bit. That's incredible. Hey Brenna, I'm going to have to wind things up here but first of all I just wanted to thank you so much for being a part of the summit today. I wanted you, to, would you let people know if they want to you know, get a copy of your book, if they want to reach you, what, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Well, um, you, my website is www.oncameratraining.com, the same name as my studio, um, and you can contact me through my, my website. My email is there. My phone is there. Um, our book, You Can Work on Camera, is a Heinemann publication, and you can get it from the publisher, or you can get it on Amazon.com. Great. Brenda, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Um, just because there were some other questions that I wasn't able to get to, I'm going to stick around after uh, the, the summit is over today, and I'll continue to go through any questions that you have. So feel free to continue to email them in, and uh, or text them in. And um, Brenda, thank you again. We're going to take a couple of minute break here, and then we will be back really soon. Thank, thank you. you so much again. Great to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Uh huh.